what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through early detection of keratoconus, the video keratography, and then discuss the OCT and then discuss how you can complement refractive surgery screening with OCT. So, as you know, it's important to detect early keratoconus or keratoconus suspect. And here's an example of a patient upon whom in the very earlier days I did LASIK on the right eye. And you can see what happened. Uh, developed ectasia, even though the other eye, it had formed fresh keratoconus because I did PRK and it did quite well. So uh, it's still really important to screen and uh, to rule out these subtle cases. So uh, I divide keratoconus into four diagnostic categories, uh, clinically obvious, early keratoconus with no slit lamp findings, but retroillumination signs, form thrust keratoconus, no slit lamp findings, but typical keratoconus topography and keratoconus suspect, no slit lamp findings, but atypical topography. Um, and Mark Amsler was the first to describe these subtle topographic changes in clinically normal individuals in 1938, and we've been learning from him ever since. This is the device that he used, handheld photographic placido disc. And this is an upside down slide, but you can see where these lines are skewed a little bit. In a patient that's clinically normal, he labeled these as form frost or early keratoconus. And over time, as he followed them, he found out that about a large percentage of them eventually developed clinically obvious keratoconus. This is the cornea scope, which was the next iteration after the handheld placido disc. And then came computer assisted video keratography which has been around now, uh, I guess, approximately 20 years. I can't believe it's that long. But the nice thing about video keratography is it spans the whole cornea uh, from a center to the limbus and gives you thousands of data points. Uh, and it's relatively accurate and reproducible. And this is what a typical keratoconus patient looks like. Um, inferior steepening, uh, asymmetric bow tie with skewed radial axis topography. So uh, how do you to rule out subtle forms of keratoconus, well, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to see what normal topography looks like. And these are all patients with normal topography. There's also a patient with normal topography. And this is a little diagram here, which shows you all the variations you can get in normal patients. This pattern here, which I call the asymmetric bow tie with skewed radial axis, is only found in about 0.5% of the normal population. But it's a similar pattern to that seen in patients with clinically obvious keratoconus. And so we labeled this particular uh, pattern form thrust keratoconus. And over time, we actually showed that this kind of pattern is a pattern that goes on to develop keratoconus. This is a paper published in Ophthalmology where we looked at the fellow eyes of patients with unilateral keratoconus. And you can see how this patient with inferior steepening and skewed radial axis proceeded from this pattern to eventually clinically obvious keratoconus. Um, there are things that can mimic keratoconus suspect or uh, form for us keratoconus such as hard contact lens wear. And you can see here's a patient that came in for refractive surgery screening who actually was a soft contact lens wearer. And he was rejected for refractive surgery. And I kept this patient out of his contact lenses for eight weeks. Eight weeks later, you can see the topography is almost normal. So even soft contact lenses can cause warpage, and you should be aware of it. It can be as long as six weeks sometimes. Um, because doctors had a hard time interpreting maps, what we did is we developed some indices, uh, one of them being the IS value that's commonly used now for assisting and in interpreting whether video keratography maps are abnormal. And here's a typical patient, you see some inferior steepening, and the question is, is this patient normal or abnormal? Uh, and these kind of indices helped to determine that. We then developed this index called the SRAX index, which quantifies the amount of skewing above and below the horizontal meridian. And then what we did is we combined all these indices into another index called the KISA percentage index, uh, which is published in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. And it, the bottom line is any patient that had a value of greater than 100 uh, had keratoconus, and patients that had less than 60 were normal, and suspect was in between 60 and 100. Um, and here you can see is a bunch of patients that we followed over time, and you can see this KISA percentage index got worse over time, as did the pattern from inferior steepening to eventually asymmetric bow tie with skewed radial axis. Um, so that was our work on topography, and we still use that a lot, and I still use topography. I think it's the main device that I use. But then I thought, well, I'd like to find ways to actually complement, because there are some cases that where you get inferior steepening, which really 
you still are unsure, and even with topography, you can't rule out an abnormality. So came along the way for an analyzer, and we found out that one of these Zernike polynomials called coma uh, was pretty useful for detecting uh, early forms of keratoconus. So vertical coma uh, is an early sign uh, in a really a subtly uh, abnormal topography. And here you can see we looked at RMS coma in three different groups, normal, suspect, and keratoconus, and divide them very nicely. We then showed that if you take a product of vertical coma and the IS value, that was more accurate than the IS value of vertical coma alone in differentiating uh, keratoconus suspect, normal, and keratoconus groups. And here's an example uh, of a patient. You can see uh, the coma is abnormal, um, and uh, we were using that routinely until the OCT came along. And I must say, I'm really not a consultant, and I really don't talk much for them, but it's probably one of my favorite devices. Uh, that I now use to complement um, refractive surgery screening. Uh, the nice thing about it is it gives you pachymetry data on multiple points. It's accurate and it's reproducible. Here's an example of a patient with um, obviously uh, abnormal topography, uh, maybe early keratoconus, and you can see here that the pachymetry value is the same as the one central. And as you go down, it should be getting steeper. And in fact, it stayed the same, so that patient's highly suspicious. Now, here's a more subtle case where you can see there's a, some subtle uh, inferior steepening. And if you look down here, you can see really this patient should have got a lot thicker and hasn't, so that's the kind of patient you want to rule out. So let's go through this little clinical exercise, and then I will discuss a little bit of research findings, and I'll tie up. Is this patient got early keratoconus? And I'm talking about this patient here. Well, you can see, look at the coma. Coma is 0.47 on the other eye that I showed. And here you can see there's on the OCT, it's a little bit thin. And so again, this question is, is this early keratoconus? And you can see that that particular patient with inferior steeping had a coma of 1.11, and normal is 0.62. And here you can see, uh, if you look inferiorly, you can see there that patient is 5 than 5 micron. Centrally, it's 5 than 14, so that cornea is thin. Um, and then again, is the question, is this early keratoconus? And the answer is yes. There are three reasons why that patient on the left is early keratoconus. First, they have inferior steepening. Two, they have wavefront analysis shows coma of greater 0.62. And three, the OCT confirmed that there was thinning. Without the OCT, um, I would not have known that that subtle thinning occurred in that particular patient. So let me tell you a little bit about the research data that we've done with the OCT. Here we looked at multiple variables uh, from topography, from OCT, and from wavefront. And we analyzed them, and we found out that the most significantly, statistically significant differences uh, between these groups was the minimum pachymetry and the IS value. The minimum pachymetry uh, is the thinnest point on the cornea, and the IS value, as we described previously, describes asymmetry. So we came up with a new index, it's called which incorporates both OCT and topography. It's the thinnest pachymetry by OCT divided by the IS value on topography. So obviously, the more advanced the keratoconus is, the thinner the cornea is going to become. And, um, and, the, uh, and the higher the IS value, the lower the PIS value will be. And here's the formula. It's a minimum pachymetry over IS value plus 0.1 times 4. Any value below 100 is abnormal. So here we looked at four different groups, normal, suspect, early keratoconus, and form for us, and you can see how that value really separates these groups out very nicely. And here, if you look here, there's a comparison using multiple variables, and you can see the PIS uh, index was statistically more significantly uh, different, in uh, better in separating normals and early keratoconus patients. Uh, and here's a bunch of patients with form thrust and keratoconus suspect where we could actually look at all the different variables and use them to show these patients who have normal. So let me show you some clinical examples of how this index works. And I think I'm still good on time. I'm t 10 minutes into it, so I've got another five minutes left. Uh, so this is a normal cornea, and I think you all would agree it's normal. And if you look there, the pachymetry is normal. And if you look at the PIS value, it's 337. Anything below 100 is abnormal. This, you would agree, has got an ABSRAX pattern, and you can see uh, we would label this as form thrust keratoconus. 
The OCT shows a pachymetry of about 470, which could be within the normal range, although it's a lower limit than normal. But if you look at the PIS, it's 53, so it's grossly abnormal. This is a patient with early keratoconus, and you can see the PIS value is 30. So the more advanced it becomes, the lower the value is. And the pachymetry there is 486. Here's a patient that came in as a candidate for LASIK. Uh, you can see they've got asymmetric bow tie. There's not much in the way of skewing. The cornea is a bit thin, but is this patient a candidate for refractive surgery? Well, the PIS value is definitely abnormal. It's 94. So if I use a combination of topography and OCT, there's no way I'd operate on this particular patient. Um, so by combining OCT and video keratography, uh, having them side by side, which is what we routinely do now in our practice, you can really, even without these fancy formulas, you can look at a map, see whether maybe you think it's abnormal, look at the OCT, and it will show you that there's some thinning in the area where there shouldn't be thinning. The formulas are very nice, and it's mainly a research tool, but from a clinical point of view, it's a very practical way to do screening, and I, I find it very reliable. Um, Dan Reinstein spoke a lot about just looking at the epithelium, and he's published some work using the Artemis, which is a device that he's involved with, and he showed that the epithelium thins over the cone. Uh, so you get thinning over the, over the cone in keratoconus and in early keratoconus, and he, he suggested that maybe we could use this as a tool for detecting subtle forms of keratoconus. Well, the um, OptiView has an uh, epithelial uh, mapping uh, a module. It's apparently not been approved by the FDA yet, uh, so uh, it's investigational, but we have done a little bit of work on this. And um, here's an example of a patient that I showed early on. You can see the topography may be a little bit abnormal. The cornea is a little bit thin, but still within the range of normal. Next slide, please. And this slide kind of summarizes it all. On the very far end, this is the epithelial mapping. So as I said, this, the IS value is 1.2. The, uh, the OCT pachymetry is about 467. But when you look here, and you look at this group here, uh, and you look at the minimum, uh, you look at the, um, the inferior uh, uh, pachymetry for the epithelium. The normal epithelium, the minimum, pachym the minimum pachymetry is um, 51.2. Uh, and, and for the form first, uh, the, 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 uh, it's 44.8 and uh, with a standard deviation of 4.2. But for the inferior, it's 51.9 with a standard deviation of 2.0. Now, in this particular patient, the IS value is within normal. So the pachymetry is thin, but it could be within normal. But if you look at the, the uh, epithelial uh, mapping pachymetry, it's grossly abnormal. It's 35 microns. Uh, and it should be, uh, at worst, um, less than uh, 49 microns. So this, this is a small group of patients. It's only 20 normals and 16 form for us keratoconus patients. But these preliminary data show that there may be value in just using epithelial mapping alone uh, in screening patients with keratoconus. For the moment, it's a useful adjunct, and a lot of further work needs to be done. But again, it's very promising. So uh, I hope I didn't go too fast, didn't confuse you too much, but uh, I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you.